All right, so does anyone have any general questions about uh, the material we learned so far? I think you can see how this is going to go now for the rest of the class. Basically, uh, we're going to cover some structure. I'm going to tell you what's important about it, and you're going to then dig into it with CFF Explorer or PE View. So next, we're going to move on to the optional header. All right, so we just covered DOS header and file header. Now we're moving on to the optional header. That was the second data structure that I said is actually embedded into that NT headers field. All right, so there's two, four, six, eight. There's about eight things that we care about here. This last one we're going to uh, defer until later. So the first thing we care about is the magic. Okay, actually, first thing I have to say is that there are different format for the 64 and 32 bit. This is basically where the major like incompatibility with PE view and things uh, changes. So here's your 32 bit, and here's your 64 bit. You can see that we just introduced a couple of U long longs. So this is I, actually it's interesting that it says U long long instead of keyword, but this is the 64 bit value, and so image base is going to be one of them, and then there's some other things we don't care about. I'll tell you right now, image base is just that thing saying where it wants to be located in memory. So obviously on a 64-bit system, it's going to say 64-bit address where it wants to be located starting in memory. With ALSR, it won't necessarily get that address, but it can you know, specify where it would like to be loaded. ELF does the same thing. So going into each of these, first of all, the optional header is not at all optional. It has to be there or the files will not run. Um, it was just, it was optional in the context of, so basically this is where we kind of switch over from the cough kind of stuff. So this, going back a little bit, this file header and DOS header basically, so let's see a good view of it. So this file header was more of a cough sort of thing, and you can see how this is kind of generic and can be reused. This machine field where we're talking about the different CPUs it would run on, that can be many different architectures. And you know, number of sections, that's pretty generic. You know, Unix systems use sections, uh, Windows systems use sections, time date stamp for compile, that's generic, right? So this is all kind of generic stuff. Characteristics in terms of 32-bit or 64-bit and so forth. Now when we get into the optional header, uh, the optional header is where Windows embeds all of its Windows specific, all of its PE specific things. And so obviously other formats could have extended COF in other ways using other optional headers. But we're just going to talk about how P does it basically. All right, so the magic field is the actual thing which is used by the loader in order to determine whether it's going to treat this like a 32-bit or a 64-bit binary. So if the magic is set to 10C, then it's going to parse the header like this. Right, it's going to parse it like a 32-bit header. It's going to pull a 32-bit image base out of that field. If the magic is set to 20C, yes. So isn't that supposed to be 14C? I thought did that 14C. 14C was actually that previous machine field. So now we're on like a different field. Ah, but, okay. but yes. So this is like I said, the previous one. It was kind of saying it's a 32 versus 64 with a normal, well-formed binary made by a compiler. Those things are going to match up. But the reality is this is the thing that actually determines 32 or 64 bit. The previous one is more like the CPU architecture and it just, if it says it's 64 bit, it's probably going to be a 64 bit binary. It doesn't actually have to be. You'll, if, so one of the things I haven't shown you is with CFF Explorer, you can go and manipulate files and, and things like that and write them back out. And you'll see that actually, if you change this from a 32 bit to 64 bit, the file will stop working. If you change that previous machine field that we learned about, the 14C, it still works fine. So the OS loader doesn't really care about that previous machine field, but it's a, a first indication. But this is the authoritative thing that says, I'm a 32 or a 64-bit binary. Because if it's 10C, it parses the data structure like this. If it's 20B, it parses the data structure like this. So that's why magic is important. So in this next round two, you're going to be getting questions, is this the 32 or 64-bit binary? You probably want to pay attention to this field instead of the previous field because they may not actually match up. It may be a manipulated thing where one field says it's 32, one says it's 64. But as I said, this is the authoritative source. Question? Is it 10C or 10B? On one of the files I have it's showing uh, 10B. Good 32. question. Let's confirm. Yeah. 
important. This is basically an RBA. So again, it's a relative address. It's not going to be an absolute address. It's relative address into the file where the first bit of code is that's going to run in this executable. So basically, the header is trying to say, like, look, OS loader, once you're done setting everything up, mapping everything into memory, jump to this location and start executing code. So address of entry point, if you're debugging a file, for instance, you know, you want to debug some malware, you don't know where the code is, you don't know, maybe it doesn't export anything in a DLL, you can still guarantee that uh, you can go to the address of entry point and set a breakpoint right there, and you'll catch it before it runs any code. Except for one caveat that we'll talk about much later called TLS. But overwhelmingly, this is the first location where code will actually run. I just put that caveat in there because otherwise the people in the video are going to like watch to right here, and they're going to email me saying, no, there's other places that you can run code. Anyways, this is the first official location where the code will start. Size of image is the total size of this file once it's mapped into memory. So it's basically taking uh, everything from disk that's get mapped into memory. The OS loader needs to know, you know, the OS loader could like walk through and go figure out, you know, this plus this plus this plus this equals how much memory I need. But for convenience, basically, you just have the size of image field where the OS loader looks at this, allocates that much space, and then maps the pieces into that space appropriately. So this will be the total size of the binary once it's actually mapped into memory. <clears throat> Section alignment and file alignment. These are two things that we're going to talk about here in the context of PE that don't have, well, section alignment has an analog in ELF, but file alignment doesn't. So, I already kind of made reference, there's going to be these things called sections that are going to have their own little names. They're going to have different pieces of memory that have code or data. But section alignment is about when you have this code or data that's sitting in disk <coughs> or file, you want to know what multiples they should be mapped into memory. So what you'll typically see is that section alignment will be set to X1000 because this is the thing that the memory manager in operating systems use typically is their, their smallest unit that they deal with. Hex 1000 is the size of one page uh, in, in the Intel virtual memory architecture. So basically, OS loaders, OS is typically only deal with hex 1000 bytes at a time uh, for allocating memory. And so section alignment is basically saying, look, I've got this chunk of the file on disk, and I'm going to give it a section name, and it's going to have its own little properties. When that section on disk gets mapped into memory, I want you to align it at a location that is a multiple of X1000. So you can start putting it at virtual memory, you know, 1000, 2000, 3000, 4000, whatever. The reality of the situation is that if this, uh, and if this ends up not being obeyed, it has no negative consequences. So this functionally doesn't matter, but this is to, to understand uh, how yeah, I'm actually kind of thinking of that. I should maybe take this out now, but this is basically the purpose of this. The duality between these two things is that sectional alignment says when I map something into memory, it should be at a multiple of this. And file alignment says when I have this data in disk, it should be a multiple of this. And so file alignment uh, is basically saying that if you don't have multiples of, for instance, hex 200, you need to pad out the file before you put the next section. So you say you have a section that's 10 bytes big. You write your 10 bytes, and then you need to pad out the file space until you get from, you know, say, offset 0 to offset 200, and now you can write the next section. And then if you don't have enough space, you pad it out to 200 again. So 200, the size, again, makes sense in the context of 512 is a sector on a hard drive, and hex 80 is a weird one that I've seen very rarely, but Eventually, oh, I say not sure what the significance is. Someone eventually told me that it's a uh, size of a sector on a floppy disk, like a All 
right? So, so file alignment definitely does matter. Um, and so we'll see two situations later where because of file alignment, sometimes you'll have a section be, oh no, I don't want to jump forward to that, never mind. All right, so for now, but you need to know for purposes of you know, the quiz and so forth, section alignment has to do with how you align stuff when it's mapped from file into disk. File alignment has to do with how you align stuff on disk. So the sections on disk. All right, image base is then, as I said, yeah, question. So, so on disk, so that's in the executable file The file itself. that you're actually opening up the file okay. system, yes. So image base, as I said, is basically the header file. It's the header trying to say, I would like to be located at this address when I'm mapped into memory. So this can have to do with uh, some potential optimizations. So, so one thing is that, um, you know, well, back in, well, it's still the case. Microsoft will, for instance, they call it rebasing DLLs, which basically is saying they're going to figure out addresses that all the DLLs can ask for so that this one gets mapped here and then that one gets mapped there and then that one gets mapped there so that none of them overlap basically. So they can each get loaded into memory at a non-overlapping address so that when the OS loader is trying to load them up, it says, hey, I would like to be loaded here. And then it says, okay, let me check if that's free. And it says, yes, it's free. Go ahead and get mapped there. So if you don't rebase the things, everybody, the linker will just, you know, or the, yeah, the linker will make it so that everybody has some default address. So everyone will always be asking for hex, you know, 40,000 or hex 1000000. So you'll often see, you know, third party stuff that hasn't been rebased and you'll always have the compiler default address. But, um, yeah, so the main point is, let's first think in the context of non-ALSR systems, let's think like a normal XP system. How it typically works on an XP system is the EXE that you double click on loads itself up into memory. It says, I'd like to be located at image base, you know, hex 1000 or something like that. No, some large, hex 100,000. It says, I would like to be located there. The OS says, sure thing, you know, foo.exe, I'm gonna locate you there in memory. And it's gonna go look for all of its DLLs, and it's gonna look at all of them, and each of them says, I would like to be located here. And it says, is it free? Yes, go ahead. Is it free? Yes, go ahead. And so it'll map all of them into their preferred base addresses. Now, it can be the case that, you know, you've got some third-party DLL where both of them just use the default base address. So DLL A got loaded into memory, and now DLL B comes along and says, I would like to be located at that address as well. The OS says, nope, already used. And then that DLL gets moved elsewhere by the OS. And so that's, um, that's called relocating the thing. And so DLLs have to have metadata within them in order to, like, fix up uh, where they're going to go later based on getting moved around. So I feel like I'm going too in-depth right now, but I, I still want to say it. On Linux systems, your shared libraries will typically be compiled as position-independent code, meaning they basically can go anywhere in memory and they'll run just fine. On Windows, you don't even have compiler options for position-independent code, which means when you compile code, it assumes it's going to be located wherever this image base says it will be located. It assumes that, and then any sort of like access to global variables and things like that, they'll actually use absolute virtual addresses in the assembly code saying like, I need to go grab from that global variable at x102,000 or something like that. And so if there's hard-coded constants inside of this assembly where they're assuming that they're going to be located at this base address, and it turns out the OS can't load them at that base address, you need this other metadata that we'll learn about probably more like tomorrow called relocation that is basically a bunch of list of locations that you, that the OS loader needs to hack the constants in the assembly or in uh, other places in the, in the file headers in order to say, you asked for hex 100,000, I gave you hex 200,000, I need to now add hex 100,000 to all of your constants. And so image base has to do with whether things get loaded where they want to get loaded, and when they don't, you got to go fix it up because on Windows especially, the code was compiled assuming that it always gets its preferred base address. Now obviously we know on like Windows 7 systems where you have ALSR, they have, you know, they have much less probability of doing it. But as we'll see later, there's different fields where you, you know, opt out of ALSR. You say, look, don't move me around in memory. I can't work anywhere else in memory, right? And so if, if an EXE is compiled without the relocation information, for instance, 
it'll say like, look, you need to put me at the location I want, otherwise I'm not going to run up. You know, I'm just going to break. The OS can still put them there, and it can just still run and break. But uh, but yeah, so image base is basically the executable saying, pretty please put me at this virtual address so that we don't have to do any work to to fix up my assembly and so forth. All right. So any questions on these first five things? I guess six things I've already covered. Right. So magic is just saying whether it's 32 or 64. Address of entry point, first code to execute, size of image, total size and memory. So basically size of image and uh, base address. You can think, here's the image base, and then here's size of image, and that's the total range of memory that that thing's going to take. Section header is saying, I want to be aligned. I want my sections to be aligned on offsets like this. And file alignment says, I want my sections on disk, on file, to be aligned on offsets like this. Any questions on those quick? We're going to talk about characteristics. All right, so we saw characteristics in the previous thing. This characteristics is more interesting from a security perspective because it contains those things, like I just said, whether or not it supports, whether or not it will allow you to move it around with ALSR. So uh, the first thing is this dynamic base, image characteristic dynamic base. <coughs> if you set the slash dynamic base option and it went at compile time, it's basically you're telling the linker my code will support being moved around in memory. And so this will basically always be set by default on the DLL. And so it'll always, you know, DLLs are just expected that they need to be able to handle gracefully if they get moved to memory. But if you're making an EXE and you don't set this, then you're not going to, uh, this plus another thing basically, you're not going, sorry. If you make an EXE and you don't set this, you're basically saying to a Windows 7, Windows 8, Win Windows Vista, don't move me around in memory, right? And the reason you would typically say that is because you don't have those relocation stuff. You can't, you don't have a big list of where to fix it up. If you do set this, if you do have dynamic base set, you're saying to the OS, yeah, go ahead and move me around in memory, ALSR me, all you like. So this is explicitly saying I support ALSR. All right, the next one, force integrity. This has to do with digital signing, which we'll talk about pretty much at the end of the PP material. And it's saying, look, don't even load me unless I have a digital signature, a digital signature attached, and if that digital signature checks out. So the nice thing is obviously, you know, you don't want it to be the case that an attacker can just like toggle that bit off, right? So the digital signature obviously goes over all of the header information. So that if you set that and then you digitally sign your file, it's you know built into the signature that if they toggle that off, the signature will no longer verify. So that is basically just saying, look, you must check my code signature before you run this. You use that on you know kernel modules, for instance, because Windows 7 requires kernel module signing. All right, NX compat. This flag is saying. I support you making my data regions non-executable. So make my stack non-executable, make my heap non-executable, make my you know, data section non-executable. And this is, you know, uh, data execution prevention, DEP is what Microsoft calls uh, the use of this NX flag, which is a memory flag that just says, mark this chunk of memory as non-executable, but it's still, uh, you can basically, you can either be writable or you can be executable, but you don't want to be both at the same time because you don't want an attacker writing code and then executing that code. So with your typical stack overflow, for instance. So this is just saying my binary does not do any crazy things where it like writes data onto the stack and then executes it. So you can go ahead and mark all of my data as non-executable. Yes, that's all I want to say about that. And then the last one is if you set this flag saying, I have no structured exception handling, uh, SEH, structured exception handling, is how Windows deals with exceptions. And um, basically, if you set this, then it's telling Windows, look, if I have an exception, don't try to like go parsing the handlers, because there's, and this matters for us, for security people, because, um, because there's a different type of buffer overflow where you overflow into the structured exception handler information. and if you have this set, then basically you're telling the operating system, 
look, even if someone buffer overflowed to the point where they've corrupted my structure of exception handlers, don't even bother trying to like parse any of that or execute any of that because that can potentially cause an attacker to uh, gain control. So just like, if you get an exception, just kill me, basically. That's what that says. So um, again, these are where you would, these are what you would actually set. Okay. And what I didn't say here, back at the dynamic base, is that for an exe, you have to add this uh, fixed equals no in order to get the compiler to generate relocations for it. So a DLL, it, the compiler will always be adding these relocation information so that it can be moved around in memory. But with EXEs, you explicitly have to say, I support dynamic base, and you set fixed no so that it generates relocation information for you. Otherwise, OS will, the OS can move you around. It'll just break because the assembly code assumed particular constants. All right, this is just where they are actually in Visual Studio. So basically all of your sort of, you know, opting into extra security features like ALSR and DEP, uh, this has to be done in these headers. And so if you take, you know, Corey's Exploits 2 class, for instance, he shows, you know, how you utilize things like the Flash plugin where the Flash plugin has not set these fields when they were compiling it. And because of that, the Flash plugin is always at a fixed address and it's executable, so you can just uh, you can just jump in and use use Rob gadgets from that. So, yes. What does the ASLR stand for? Because you keep saying Sorry. ALSR. I probably am. I, I you know actually I think someone said that about my video of last time. I keep saying ALSR. ASLR address space layout randomization. For some reason ALSR just rolls off my tongue better. <laughs> ASLR. 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 All right, so here's actually then where we see these things start showing up in the characteristics. So if you were using PEView, for instance, now here's <clears throat> for this next for this next round, I would recommend potentially using PEView more than CFF Explorer, or I would recommend bouncing back and forth between them because CFF Explorer is going to give you an interpreted view of these flags. So I just gave you the raw flag names as they exist in the headers. CFF Explorer is going to give you an interpreted value, so it's going to say something like supports address randomization or something like that. And it's up to you to know that supports address randomization means that the dynamic base flag is set or something like that. So depending on the way the question is worded, it may be easier to look at it with like, you know, sometimes I'll ask you just, you know, is the dynamic base flag set, yes or no? Other times I'll say, does this support AS ASLR, right? So. Sometimes you may want to look with CFF Explorer, sometimes you may not. But yeah, CFF like Explorer doesn't parse 64-bit optional headers. It so looks like English was its first language because some of the translations are just weird. Like, image understands isolation and doesn't want it. Understands isolation <laughs> and doesn't want it. Yes. So anyway. So, okay, okay. And actually, there's one thing that I thought I fixed this in the slides, and that means I maybe didn't get the right version of these slides. One of the other flags that I that I quiz you on is actually this terminal server aware. So terminal server is um, it's basically the, the mechanism behind RDP. It's the thing that allows you to remote desktop to a Windows machine and you know interact with it as if you were you know physically at, at, a, at a GUI system. And so if I say like does this support RDP and things like that, I'm actually looking for the terminal server aware flag because. Basically, it's saying this binary, if, if you don't have this flag set, then there's this sort of backend management that happens in the kernel where it says, like, here's the graphics for the current logging user, here's the graphics for this RDP user one, here's the graphics for RDP user two. So this terminal server aware is basically saying that uh, it can play that game in the background. Do you have that in your slides out of curiosity? I'm wondering whether I sent the right slides. Does it talk about terminal server aware at all? Okay. I may have probably said these slides from, but I know I have one that I had. So. All right, so last thing, we're going to skip it for now, basically, but we'll come back to it in each subsequent round. Data directory is the last entry of the optional header, and what it really is is it's an array of, officially it's 16 things, only the first, I think, 14 or 15 are actually filled in. But what it is, this is going to be a very important data structure because this is what holds the pointers to all of this other data structure that we're going to go over in the next round. 
So this holds pointers to what functions this exports. It holds pointers to what functions it imports. It holds pointers to where the debug information can be found, where the digital certificate is, uh, where the relocation information is, where the resources is. So this is like a big, this is like the big map that like points at all of the other data structures that you're going to care about within this file. But we're basically going to go over each of these in turn as we cover imports, then we cover exports, and then we cover everything else. But the, the key thing you need to know is that it's basically an array. Uh, you know, array entry zero is exports. Array entry one is imports, for instance. So I don't think I ask you any questions about it in this round, but I want to point this out. Data directory is at the very end of the optional header. You'll see it when you're messing around with CFF Explorer and PView and so forth. But all right. Yes, so it's 16 entries. Oh, and each entry basically has only, it says virtual address, but it's rel actually a relative virtual address. So it's an RBA and a size. So it's saying, here's the RBA of this particular data structure, and here's the size of the first, you know, first data structure. Typically, it's the size of the first data structure and that data structure will point at more data structures. Key thing is, it says virtual address, it's a relative virtual address. And here's the particular indices. You may, I don't know if I have any questions that necessitate it, but I feel like I maybe last time told people to like tear this, pull this sheet out of your thing so you can refer to it later, but I'm not sure if that's necessary right now. But this shows you the kind of stuff that points at exports, imports, resources. Security is actually the certificate if it's present, GLS. All right, so this is how I used to do quizzes before we had the game. I said, you know, pop quiz hotshot, which fields do we even care about and why? So I'll ask you this quick. But you'll see in this, this coming up round, I'm going to have you do round two. And then when you're done with round two, it's actually going to send you back and ask you five questions from round one. When you get done with you know, round three later on, it's going to ask you five questions from round one and round two. So it'll keep every time you get past a new round, it'll ask you five random questions from previous rounds, randomly selected. So this is my you know, way of continuing reinforcing the previous material so I don't completely forget. But for now, which two fields do we care about and why? Anyway, magic. Joe, magic, why? So you can see how the file can be uh, processed by the, uh, the loader. So we can see how the file will be processed by the loader. So basically, yes, it, it's basically it's going to be a magic number that's going to say, you know, loader, figure out that this is an executable file. And if it doesn't see, what, what's the value it's going to want to see there? Uh, either 10B or 10. No, what file? Which one? <coughs> magic. Very first, very beginning of the file. Okay. MZ. MZ, yes. Oh. You're thinking of machine. Or are you thinking of magic. You're thinking of optional header magic, yes. But for the DOS header magic, MZ, right? First thing, if the OS loader doesn't see an MZ there, it says, ah, eh, this isn't an executable file. I don't need to process it, right? All right, what other file field do we care about here? Wait, wait. Last, last one. Last one, ELFA new, yes. Why do we care about it? Why do we care about it? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it gets us, gets us to, the, to the next. It gets image. us to the next data structure, the NT headers data structure. Yep. 